Oh, sorry, didn't see you there. All right, um, so I guess it's been a while since we've checked in with everyone. A couple races under your belt now. Um, Ironman Copenhagen and the Collins Cup both have since passed. Well, that's not entirely true that I didn't check in. In fact, I did a full-scale post-race interview, raw, said things that probably shouldn't have said. Talbot got his camera stolen. And that contained the memory card, which had all of our race footage and interviews, etc. So here we are doing it again. Uh, Copenhagen was a step in the right direction. It was a challenge, of course. We went to the tri battle, got onto the time zone, and just as we were getting onto the time zone, turned around, flew back, and came here for another month. And then, you know, on the time zone, actually, probably a little too hardcore. I was like getting up at like 10 a.m., so which is like uh, 7 p.m. or something where we were headed. And so that made the travel and the time change really, really hard going back. To Europe this time round. Definitely did not feel like I got on the time zone in time for the race. It was quite challenging. I think I only had a couple of days with a decent amount of sleep. Otherwise, it was like four hours of sleep every night. But that's part of world travel. And so race went, I don't, I don't really know if it could have went any better. I had a great swim. First time under 50 minutes. I don't know if the course was accurate or not. It doesn't really matter. I just compare myself to the guys around me. And I knew I was swimming well because I would say about 1,000 meters in, I look over to my right and I noticed Igor Amarelli, who is a guy literally back in 2014 when I did Steelhead. He came out of the water five and a half minutes ahead of me. And now here we are in 2021 and I was swimming next to him. Now. He, when he noticed me swimming next to him, he realized he was having a horrible swim and in the wrong swim pack and then went straight to the front of that pack and then actually eventually pulled away from us. But uh, for me, that was a win. So that was good. Uh, we had some, some commotion out on the course right towards the end of the swim. I would say about 400 to go. There's the, this, it was an odd, like almost like this triangle thing you had to swim. And got into like a, a, an ethical dilemma, I guess, because I was the pack I was in, many of the guys were about to cut the course and swim and just cut the triangle off and swim straight across. And I knew that that was the wrong way. And uh, so you're having this odd group think type dilemma going on in your head of, well, if everyone's cutting the course, then they're probably not gonna do anything to us, but it's not the right thing. So. We went through that dilemma for a few seconds and decided to swim the course and not risk getting a DQ. Mind you, it didn't matter because the guys who cut the course never got DQ'd anyway, so it wouldn't have happened to me. But it was the right thing to do to swim the course, especially if you know <laughs> that it's the right way to swim. But that was interesting. Out onto the bike, I actually got out there ahead of Cam Wharf. I saw him on his feet, and then we both had that ethical dilemma, and I actually ended up coming out ahead of him because uh, he also made the right decision to go back and swim the right direction. And so I had a bit of a gap, and then uh, he caught up very quickly, and then, uh, you know, I witnessed his excellent cycling prowess, particularly through the European roads, which I honestly have absolutely no experience with. Uh, I have no idea what's a road, what's a sidewalk, what's a bike lane, no clue. Three, four times I was up riding on the curb and had to actually jump off the curb because I'm not actually on the road. I can't tell things apart. Cobblestones, all this stuff. <clears throat> and I watched him, you know, I'm pushing 340 watts and I watch him easily ride away from me just because I suck so bad at riding bikes other than the power aspect. And so that was the end of that. So then it became, uh, you know, basically just try to ride to the best of my ability on that type of a course. And it wasn't great. Admittedly, my biking has not been in great form this year, but uh, it was pretty perplexing to see how much time he was able to put into me. I averaged 285 watts, which isn't my best bike by any means, but it was not a horrible bike and uh, he outrode me by 10 minutes. So 10 minutes, I would say, is pretty well game over against just about anyone in an Ironman. But 
whatever, you know, mentally, he really broke me. Um, I, I actually thought about, you know, I had all these excuses and stuff, and um, I actually was going to drop out. I had fully committed to dropping out because I just, he, he mentally broke me so much, put so much time into me. It was so hard to wrap my head around. And eventually I got to the run and I just made it. No, 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 don't do that. Or too many Ironmans and... Hey! No, no, no! Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 and then, yeah, at about halfway, I realized actually was kind of pulling almost exactly enough time back to catch him right at the finish line. That became motivating, and so then I kept working hard, and I actually started to feel like, hey, I might actually be able to catch this guy. And eventually, I got the deficit down to about a minute and 15, and unfortunately, I blew up at about 38K and gave back two minutes, but... It was a step in the right direction. I would say it's actually probably the furthest I've ever made it in an Ironman uh, before blowing up. And I ran out of nutrition at about 25K and the aid stations were pretty far apart. So for me, I feel like maybe I consumed about 30 grams of carbs in the final hour. And so the take home for me was because I was still muscles functioning really well. I felt extremely hungry at the finish line. And so the take home for me was I was probably quite low, low carb. Uh, and I just needed, I think, to have one more uh, of my gel flasks full of gel. And I think I would have been able to close that final 4K. So we're moving in the right direction. At least the muscles are functioning all the way to the finish. Fortunately, though, two times in a row, I got the final Kona spot. Uh, I'm making a habit of this, which I would prefer not to do any longer. But I was happy to get that spot. And I was happy to put together a pretty good, it's probably one of, I would say it's probably my best like all around execution in terms of pure numbers. My performance at Arizona in 2016 was certainly better in terms of pure numbers. Uh, but this was a good all around swim bike run for me. And so I was very happy with that. And then we had the challenge of course of traveling uh, to Slovakia. And then there was quite a heavy media engagement you know, schedule for the Collins Cup. Fortunately, if there was a time where you were going to have a heavy media schedule, I would say it's the week after an Ironman because you probably should be recovering and sitting around and just eating and drinking and not really, you know, trying to train too, too much. The Collins Cup, the whole week leading in was an amazing experience. The first time, you know, I've kind of and Aaron said this to me that I normally would say this, you know, I'm not really looking to make friends with these guys because when you get out there, you don't really want to have a soft spot for any of these guys. You want to destroy them and crush them. But, uh, you know, spending a week with them, I, I, thought, I found it quite fascinating. Everyone was actually uh, very warm and welcoming and some really great guys. I'd say that's probably one of the unique things about our sport is that it's not fighting. It's not, you know, it's not actually very aggressive it's very internal and so there's no reason why we can't actually be you know decent friends and decent uh relationships with each other so i had a really good time that's the first time i think i ever spent you know real quality time with my competitors and the highlight of course was on wednesday my my first bike ride after the iron man and I thought I was going out for a 180 watt easy spin. And of course, Gustav and his brother Mikhail were uh, about to head out for a, a bike ride. And they turned back around and said, hey, you headed out for a bike ride? And I was like, yeah, I didn't really plan on biking with you guys, though. Uh, and then I ended up doing a bike, actually, Gustav's final bike workout with him, four times eight minutes with one minute recovery. And for the first one, just, of course, to gather data, I gave them the 10 meter draft zone and I pushed 385 watts to keep up. And then I said, this is ridiculous, I won't do that again. And I suck wheel for the remaining three and still uh, pushed about 320 watts in the draft. So I must say though, that was a lot of fun and really uh, shows me that, you know, I probably would do quite well with, you know, having more training partners, even on the bike. I I've always said, I don't really feel like I need people on the bike, but I had so much fun and I pushed myself, it probably would be great to have training partners. So something to think about for the future. 
Recovered decently well, actually was on the schedule. Was starting to get eight hours of sleep pretty well every night, which was great. My whoop got me in the green, I would say two or three times leading into it. So I was feeling actually quite good, quite confident. I got selected to race against. Uh, we now move on to match number nine. And match number nine, the first pick goes to Team Internationals. We're going with the man, Lionel Sanders. <laughs> Lionel to the stage, please. Team Europe, what card are you going to play? Ah. Uh... Ah, uh, you know, Lionel is a little bit handicapped after last week, so, so easy one, Sebastian. Sebastian Keenley to the stage, please. <laughs> the crowd reaction tells you all you need to know. And finally, uh, for match uh, number nine, Team US. I know these two think they're great cyclists. But we're going to have, pick a guy who is going to show them exactly what you can do on a bicycle. <laughs> Andrew Starkowitz, get up here. Andrew, come on up, please. So match number nine, all about the two wheels. One of the most fascinating head-to-heads coming at you on Saturday between three seasoned veterans. The mind games have begun already. Take a pose, please. Fire away the photographers. Thank you very much indeed. Take your places once again, gents. So Andrew Starkowitz and... Sebastian Keenley, whom I think was, was the right call on a coach's standpoint. You know, I have the most experience racing both those guys. Uh, you definitely need to be able to ride the bike well against those guys. And then you need to be able to run off extremely tired legs from biking so hard. And so I think it was the right matchup to score points for my team, to have a shot at a W. And so, you know, I was happy with that. And I'm always excited to race those guys. And so... Just focused on, uh, for me, the name of the game was having a good swim. And I was a little bit, admittedly, when I found out that it was going to be directly into the current and that the current was quite strong, that, that kind of got into my head a little bit and I was worrying about that. So it became even all the more important to try and catch some feet. And there was only one set of feet I knew to catch and it was going to be Starkey. And so uh, we dove in. And actually, Keenley has quite good takeout speed. And so he got out ahead of me. And, I, and then he was on Starkey's feet, and then I could feel that uh, the pace was slowing too quickly, too rapidly, and so I actually went around Keenley, and then I bridged the gap onto Starkey's feet, and then Starkey knew we were gonna try and get on his feet, and so he swam like the most horrible line, literally he was gonna take us out into the middle of the river and make a beeline to the right and leave us out there to fend for ourselves, us weak swimmers, and that's exactly what he did, and Fortunately, I, I semi, I can tell I'm getting better at swimming because tactically I fully was aware of everything that was going on. I was aware of distances. I was aware of where everyone was. Um, and so I was able to stay on his feet and he wasn't able to shake me really. And, but I could see I was doing, when I would, I would do one breath uh, and I would look back and I saw Keenley, the gap was opening up and I actually was quite happy with that because I knew that Ke I didn't really want to go toe to toe on the run five days after with Keenley, so I knew if we could get a minute and a half on him in the water, that would be you know good for me. And then uh, just stuck on his feet, he still continued to try and drop me for probably the first half, and then onto the second half, I thought that he was trying to drop me, but afterwards, he told me he actually wasn't trying to drop me, that he was actually trying to swim more in the center because the current was stronger, and I thought he was just trying to do that same thing to me again and leave me out there. And so with about 400 go, I said, you know, to heck with it, you can swim whatever line you want. I'm just going to swim the buoy line. And uh, that was actually a mistake. It was kind of an interesting test because in just 400 meters or so, he was able to put 10 seconds into me um, because I was no longer in the draft. So it's, it's quite, even that's with the current now. And so that I, th I found that to be quite fascinating how quickly you lose time if you're not in that draft. So anyways, I made that time back up in the run up. And so I actually got out onto the bike where we were side by side. He dropped his visor. And so then I got out onto the bike ahead of him. And my only goal, and I had told all you know the other two guys this, was I, I felt so defeated by Cam in Copenhagen that I just had to get some confidence back on the bike. And so I was just going to ride as hard as I could. I didn't even use power. It's the first time since 2014 I didn't even use power. I have the data, but I had no way to see what it was going to be. <clears throat> and I just rode by feel, and I rode hard. 
and you know i was happy i was i was excited to get out there i was going to be first out onto the highway and then i was just going to ride real hard and i took a corner too fast and i crashed and i thought oh my gosh that's the end of my season because i just broke my hip and so i was a little scarred a little shaken took me a while to get back up i dropped my nutrition and i don't know i was so out of it that i couldn't figure out i was trying to get on the bike and grab the nutrition and i couldn't figure out how to do both at the same time so i left the nutrition and just got back on the bike and that was a horrible mistake as well because there was only one aid station on the bike at 33 kilometers and all my water had dropped out of my front thing and here i go on and on about good nutrition and how i'm learning all these lessons of nutrition and hydration and i drop all of it and i have nothing and and it's twist top water bottles which literally you can't even pour into the fuel silage and so i had about one sip of water in that entire bike ride which is not ideal in any way but anyways doesn't matter you got to adapt rode decently well uh, after the crash i had to catch up starkey took quite a bit of power i have no idea how much i didn't really analyze it too deeply but i would imagine about 380 watts to bridge the gap back to him and then i kept him at about 100 meters in front of me and there was really no way cam wharf can call me a draft pack rat whatever the words he uses are but it just was too hard. like i couldn't really bridge the final 100 meters that's about as close as i could get there was absolutely no incentive or way for me to catch him and then try and pass him just because the power was too much i ended up averaging 350 on the bike uh he outbiked me starkey outbiked me by about two seconds so had i not crashed had i been able to handle my bike i probably would have had the fastest bike split which is a win for me is that's the only thing i wanted to do was get a little bit of confidence back and so i did that and then on to the run uh starkey didn't have the greatest transition he kind of went the wrong way a little bit and then turned around and came back which i don't know why he did because the way he went was longer anyway so it didn't really like it was a disadvantage but anyways, that allowed me to get out onto the run ahead of him. And then I just felt like I was an Ironman athlete, absolutely no leg speed whatsoever. And so I feel like I ran pretty close to the 18 kilometers at the pace that I ran the opening 18 kilometers in the Ironman the week before. And fortunately, though, it was enough to hold off Keenley. Though, had it been a half, we probably would have been, you know, shoulder to shoulder at the finish line if it was a half. But fortunately, it was only 18K. Uh, all in all, I was happy with it. I don't know how much you can expect of yourself, you know, five, six days after an Ironman. So I think the fact that the body was able to have my best bike of the year, 350 watts for 80K, um, I think is a testament to how well I've been eating. I've been recovering well. I've been taking care of my body. I've been using my Whoop in order to monitor and change my behavior in a positive way with regards to recovery and nutrition and all of these things, sleep behaviors. And so I was, I was quite happy with it. And so one thing though that I did learn from this race, from the, the Collins Cup, was that I just do not have any leg speed. I have spent three months devoted to Ironman training. And even that was subpar because I was trying to train through the heat for most of it. And that was a mistake. And you just couldn't hit the right paces. And so the lesson it told me was there's absolutely no way you're going to be competitive at 70.3 worlds and it's not fun to go to a race that you literally know that you are going to get your ass handed to you in i can tell you exactly what's going to happen you know they're going to come out the field the, the front guys are going to come out two and a half minutes ahead of me it's going to be a huge group i'm not going to be able to bridge the gap and then they're also going to outrun me by three minutes and so i'm going to finish about 15th that's what's going to happen in that race uh, so I'm going to pull it off the schedule, not because I'm ducking, because I know exactly what's going to happen. 2022, I intend to have a Kona spot, not chase a Kona spot for three months, and I intend to go to that race. Fortunately, it's going to be in St. George, my favorite course, and I'm going to be fully prepared because I won't have been chasing Ironman's KQs for three straight months through the heat uh, in preparation for it. So that's what I'm going to do in 2022 will be my goal. This year, though, is the Ironman year. I already told you I need to be able to, uh, hopefully, if Kona happens in February, I want to be confident on that start line. I go to 70.3s, I feel confident on the start line. I go to Ironmans, I feel weak, and I feel like I have no knowledge and have no idea what I'm doing. So 2021 is the year where when I go to a start line in 2022 of an Ironman, I know exactly what's going to happen. I know exactly how to execute it. And I am very confident in myself that I will contend with the best in the world. And so 
That being said, I'm going to Chattanooga and I'm going to do another Ironman. And then I learned from being with all these guys that there's going to be likely, if the race occurs, the uh, unofficial world championship in Sacramento, California. So I'm going to do another Ironman in Sacramento, California, which will be the season ender, which will also be the unofficial world champs. So I don't want to say who's going to be there because I don't know if they want to talk about that publicly, but just about everyone is going to be in California. So I'm excited for that. And in order to feel confident there, I need to go to Chattanooga and get some confidence. So thanks for tuning in. It was a fun race block. This is kind of a scatterbrained uh, post-race thing because it's literally like three weeks ago that I did Copenhagen. And uh, fortunately, I think uh, Talbot has somehow sourced a new camera and a new memory card. So we will be able to get back to doing YouTube videos again sometime soon. Uh, and maybe he can put air tags on that stuff so he don't lose it, or at least he can find it uh, when he does lose it. Anyways, thanks for tuning in, and we'll get back to some good uh, training videos soon. When they reflect back on this race, the first Collins Cup 2021, they're going to realize that it is historical. They will reflect back on this five years from now, 10 years, 15, 20 years, where they'll say, I was in that inaugural event. They're all fighting, they're all rallying, and they're trying to bring out their best on race day. But the history will say, we survived and we did it. The sport has flourished. The Collins Cup has come to fruition. And we're ready to race.